abused uh, design femas, actually various types of femas on software for probably over 20 years. So uh, uh, obviously this is a lot easier when you can see the audience. I can't see you. In the end, we're going to have a question and answer period. Uh, what I want to start off with is just an overview. We're going to first of all talk about risk. Um, it's kind of amazing to me and many many people who do FMEAs uh, that I talk to don't under, they see it as a task that they have to do. They don't necessarily see it as a risk tool. And I want to kind of make that tie today. So we're going to start off with uh, definition of risk, how risk is reduced. We're going to talk about what I like to call the classic FEMA. This is way back when it first got started in aerospace with the mill standard versus what I like to call the modern FEMA. And there's been a considerable change about what the focus of these forms are supposed to be. Uh, unfortunately, not everybody has completed that change, and so they don't see some of the benefits that they could. Uh, I'm going to be showing you today with respect to software is what I would like to call the modern FEMA. I want to talk about fault tree and FEMAs. Uh, big misunderstanding is that fault tree equals FEMA. We're going to show that it doesn't and why that's important. And then we're going to talk about sources of risk for software developers, which you're going to find out is that there's more than one source of risk you have to deal with, and consequently, there's actually more than one type of FEMA you may want to do. Now, today, we're going to concentrate on design FEMA. I'm just going to expose you that these other FEMAs are available to you to deal with these other sources of risk. Um, like I said, we're going to concentrate on design FEMAs. Right off the top, I'm going to talk about some typical misunderstandings people have. Then we're going to do a design FEMA where on software that involves the use of the hard, of hardware as well. Uh, this is probably one of the most complex for you because bottom line is, is you're at the mercy of the hardware you're trying to control. And we're going to talk about um, the importance of understanding that hardware and how it impacts your design verification you're going to do on your product. Uh, the other thing we're going to talk about is uh, using FEMAs when you use some type of agile software development tools such as Scrum. I'm going to show you how to apply them. And then finally, it's going to only be one or I think it's one slide. We're going to talk about, well, what happens in the case where I just develop software, there's no hardware involved? Can I still do design FEMAs on that? And the answer is yes. And then we'll have a quick summary. Okay, when it comes to risk, risk has two components. Uh, the first component is probability of exposure to harm when an objectionable incident occurs. So the bottom line is something has to go wrong. And second, the second component is severity of harm. So the bottom line is, is if you want to reduce risk, you either got to reduce the probability of exposure or the severity of that harm. Now, uh, historically, there has been what I call the classic FEMA approach, and in that, uh, the original theme is what we call FEMICA, Failure Mode Effect and Criticality Analysis. Uh, what would happen was, is the whole focus, they spent all this time identifying the failure modes, and then they'd take each of the failure modes, and then they'd identify all the potential effects and their harms, and then they'd try to mitigate those harms. And it was interesting in reading some of those FEMAs that there was very little time spent on the actual root cause of the failure that led to the exposure to the harm. And consequently, when you look at these older FEMAs, what you find out is, is that many do not have what I would like to call the root causes, the things that would have to have been changed to prevent the incident. The modern FEMA says it's much easier to prevent objectionable incidents than it is to try to figure out all the possible effects and to mitigate those effects. And in order to be successful using the modern FEMA, the most important thing is, is that every line of every single FEMA that you do, when you go to the cause column, it has to be a root cause. And when we talk about software, I'm going to tell you what root causes look like. Another thing is uh, because of this failure mode effect concentration, what happened over the years is people came up with the idea that uh, the FEMA was like a fault tree. In fact, many 
small tree packages started generating FEMAs and calling them FEMAs. Well, the reason why they're different is this. Number one is when you look at a fault tree, the only root cause of that original failure are the last leaves of the tree. Whereas what I said before is when you do a FEMA and you look at the cause column, that's always a root cause. So what would happen is, is when people would take the fault tree and they'd populate the FEMA with it and they'd populate the failure cause column, but what happened is, is you'd have a cause that was really a failure mode. And you, you're trying to determine what's the probability of a failure mode due to a failure mode. And the whole FEMA process got destroyed. Uh, kind of the bad news is, is as David talked about, is uh, recently, I think it was June 6th, the manual got put, early June, the manual just got published, the AIG VDA FEMA handbook. That handbook uh, literally adopts a methodology that uh, was developed in Germany and uh, first published in 1996, first developed by Mercedes in 1992. And it starts, it's based on the premise that fault tree equals FEMA. And so a lot of the uh, issues that one runs into, which is FEMAs that don't have root causes, uh, when this methodology goes to get implemented, uh, people are gonna have some challenges and it's, uh, in talking to Dave, I basically said, hey, how about if we uh, do a webinar and we take people through that handbook, uh, we explain to them, you know, how it works, you know, how does the, you know, what's the difference between if they're used to AIG fourth edition or something similar, how's it going to be different from the handbook FEMA methodology? And given the potential issues with this methodology, how does one deal with them? So if you have that kind of interest, you might want to look through that in September. Okay, so as I said before, when we started way back, I'm going to bounce back, we said uh, risk has two components, probability of exposure to harm when an objectionable incident occurs and severity of harm. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, well, what is an objectionable incident when we're talking about software? And the bottom line is an objectionable incident occurs anytime you don't meet a customer requirement. When that happens, somebody is going to be exposed to risk. And when you look at your business of developing software, we believe there's what we call five potential root causes of, object of software objectionable instance where the customer says, hey, this software doesn't do what I want it to do. And the very first one we have is incorrect customer requirements. Uh, oftentimes, we I've seen over the years, and if you're in my experience in software development, is that you're at the end of the food chain. And oftentimes, you're not aware of the customer requirements, so they're constantly changing on you. And so um, they're the first issue. And even if you were aware, what can happen is there's three types of customer requirements that exist not only in software, but in hardware as well, and it's what we call the first type that makes life difficult is what we call competing requirements. Uh, an example of a competing requirement in a, in a car would be safety and fuel performance. If I want to give you fuel performance, I take weight out of the vehicle. If I want to give you safety, I tend to put weight into the vehicle. Well, I have a customer who wants both of them. So the challenge to the design engineer becomes how do I design this product that meets both of those? Another one could be cost. They only want to pay so much money. A second type that's even more difficult that we call conflicting requirements. I was involved in an electric motorcycle that was targeted for multiple countries. And these countries actually had laws that conflicted with each other. And if we couldn't get a waiver, then we had to decide which country we, could, we were going to sell to. So we had to pick our customers. And the third one is limits of technology. Customers can come to you up front, and ask you to develop software that, quite frankly, you can think you can get close to what they want, but you don't think you can give it to them. Doesn't mean you don't have a customer, but it does mean you have to get that documented up front so they understand what it is they're buying in the software. So number one potential root cause of creating software that doesn't meet customer requirements is getting those requirements wrong. 
second thing is, is when customers speak to you, they do not talk to you in a language you typically can design to. And so that has to be translated to a specific set of design requirements that are verifiable. Uh, third thing is, we got the customer requirements. We translate them to write design requirements. Now we have to write code, and if our software has calibration factors in it, we have to make sure those factors are set correctly. We can do those incorrectly. So we can develop the wrong code, or we can miscalibrate the code. Uh, if you're involved in Agile, we actually have another translation where, and we'll talk about what Agile is later for those who don't know anything about Agile. Basically, in Agile, rather than going up to these huge uh, requirements for the software, you take these requirements and you break them into small sprint tasks, and you do little sections of the code, and you verify it, and it enables you to involve cross-functional teams and move faster through the code development. Well, the bottom line is, is if you take these design requirements that you know, the customer is buying the customer requirement, you just translate it to design requirements, you translate to the wrong sprint task requirements, what's going to happen is these small groups are going to work on their own thing. So the fourth source of risk is when you do this translation to the sprint task, you get the sprint task wrong. And the last thing is you can do all this stuff correctly if the software is not used as intended, okay, you can create, you can have issues. And this is where the user's manual, instructions, whatever, becomes very, very important. So what are the tools we have? Well, there's basically four tools that are available to the software developer. The one we're going to talk about today is the design schema, but I want you to be aware of these other tools. As far as getting the customer requirements correct and translating those to what the correct, correct software design requirements, we call this requirements risk assessment. This is not about designing the software correctly. This is about getting the right requirements to design the software to. Uh, the next tool that we have, so once we understand what it is we have to design, then we have to have a way of assessing the adequacy of the code that we create. And that's where the design schema comes in. So really, the design schema is a risk assessment of releasing the code in its current form. If you're involved in um, agile type methodologies and you're developing sprint task requirements, we can do a risk assessment to make sure that we're giving people the right sprint task. And this is going to tell us what design verification we have to do before we release those sprint tasks and how we're going to confirm that sprint code was written correctly. And then finally, as far as the software not being used as intended, we can do what we call a software application schema. So pictorially, this is what the whole thing looks like. This is in a non-agile environment. So you start here with voice of the customer, go through this customer requirements review, making sure that you've identified what you have to do in this. These requirements then have to be translated to design requirements. You do part two of this requirement risk assessment. Now, this validation, you'll actually do some form of validation before you release the design requirements. And when your software is done, you got to confirm that it meets the customer requirements. Once you have these design requirements, then you have to define the code to meet it. This is where your design team comes in, and that drives the design verification plan. Then once you believe that code is fine, we can then do a usage risk assessment trying to anticipate mistakes in usage. And it may end up coming back and making some code changes, but we need to have design in our hands before we can do a complete assessment of how easy it will be to use. So, oh, software design schema. So, the number one objective is we want to do a risk assessment of releasing the code, calibration factors in its current form. And if we make changes to the code and calibration factors, then I want to track all those changes that we did. Important deliverables are we have to have a clear, deliver clear definition of what the design requirements are. We have to have a design verification plan. This is, if you go back to what I talked about risk, 
where its probability of exposure to objectionable incidents, this design verification plan is used to determine that occurrence. And then the other deliverable is, is in large software products, we could, we're probably going to release the design before all the, in fact, you will. You'll end up releasing a design before all the risk is removed. You need to prioritize those risks and know when it is you can release them. So why haven't software design FEMA has not been effectively used? There's a misperception. The software design FEMA is a bottom up. It's a top down. It starts with the customer requirements and works its way down to the code. It doesn't start from the bottom and work its way up. As I talked before, there was a focus on, hey, I got I to gotta determine all the different ways my software can fail. No. What you have to do is you have to determine what the requirements are you have to meet. You have to define the code that controls meeting those requirements, and you got to prove that that code is correct through your design verification. Again, this concentration on mitigation of effects, no, we're going to concentrate getting the code right. And so how is it solved? Again, it's this concentration, understanding when you do a design FEMA, the only allowable entry for the cause column of design FEMA in software is in proper code calibration factors that have been, been incorrectly set. And we're going to, going to look at that now. So. As an example, we're going to use an oil application system. Basically, we're going to have some equipment that software controls that try to deliver, that tries to deliver a certain amount of oil. So here's our here's one of our design requirements. So basically, we're being told by software, we're being told as a software developer that we they want us to apply this oil at a target rate, plus minus five percent of the target. And then they give me the criteria of the hardware that I'm going to be using. The flow meter has this accuracy. The oil temperature range is going to be this. And here's the pump performance curve. Without this information, I cannot begin to write the code for this particular requirement. So it's very important that if you as a software developer ever get tasked for writing software code control hardware that you need to identify what are the characteristics of the hardware that impact your ability to meet this particular requirement so i've seen i've seen many uh themas when i first looked at them where they don't say they haven't even thought about this you know and so this is very important information so this first column if you've done a requirement risk assessment you get this right from it, and it's going to give you this. There's multiple categories of requirements. We believe there's 17 different categories that have to be looked at. Again, these design requirements have to be written to a level of detail that you can verify, both from your performance, and also you have to know what we call the degrees of freedom. So when I run this particular test, I'm going to want to make sure, since I know this oil viscosity is going to change, over this 20 to 90 F, I'm going to want to set up DV to make sure that my software has the right algorithms to handle these variations. Wish I could answer questions right now, but I can't. So anyway, this first column sets it all up. If you get this first column wrong, kind of nothing else matters. So once we get the first column, Hey, how can we fail to meet it? Well, an obvious way is we can either put too little or we can put too much. Then we ask for the harm. Now, in this particular case, it's not important that you list every possible harm. It is important that you list the worst case harm. Now, what's going to happen is if we put the worst case harm in here, we're going to over design a little bit because the probability of that worst case harm is going to be less than all the, the total probability of this particular failure mode. But if we were try to if we were to try to spend the time, like if you're like doing a, an autonomous vehicle and you were trying to determine all the possible effects, you could spend all day here. Once I identify, hey, this is safety related issue, um, I can stop there because now I've set 
at maximum level of harm. And this severity number is typically a number from one to 10 or one to five. This is a typical automotive. Uh, one is no effect. 10 is injury or violation of a law without warning. Now the new handbook coming out, uh, and we're gonna talk about this in the seminar. Um, they did a pretty decent job of this one. There's some issues, I think, on the occurrence side. But so here's just a description that you as a software developer, when your software fails to do it, it's asking you to put a numerical value on the level of harm. And that's what this particular table is used for. So now we move to the other columns. And this, this column here, this class column, a better name for this column, you know, this is the standard they use in the automotive is what we call, I like to call residual risk. It's basically, when I look at the design as it currently is now, what level of risk will the user of my software be exposed to? And it's based on two numbers, the severity of harm and this occurrence, which is the probability of this, of this failure here of too little oil because of the way I wrote the control code. I mean, this is probably, I mean, because there's going to be variation in uh, viscosities and whatever, it's going to have some fancy code that might even have some temperature inputs into it. And so what you're basically saying is when I put this occurrence number here, I'm saying based on where the code is right now, I think this is a probability that I'm going to miss this spec to the low side going to see how this, this column here is calculated, but it's based on its severity and its occurrence. The uh, next question I ask myself is, well, how am I going to assess the adequacy of this oil flow control code in meeting this requirement and preventing this too little oil? And it's this design control that's going to give me this occurrence rating. So if any of you have ever been in a design FEMA before, and while you're in the room, you determine the occurrence ratings, and Dave said that a bunch of you have FEMA experience, those people, I say, how did you do that? Because until you do this design verification, you can't assess the adequacy of this code in preventing this too little oil. This detection rating, this is the effectiveness of this method in assessing the adequacy of this code in delivering the amount of oil we want to deliver. Now, those of you who have done FEMA before, many of you have been probably taught to use RPN. Well, RPN is severity times occurrence times detection, which you give you 16 times 32. But the problem is, is that Risk doesn't have a detection component, okay? Risk has a severity of harm and a probability of exposure component. Uh, if we were doing a process FEMA and we were getting ready to ship a defect that potentially could hurt somebody, you might be able to contain it and keep it from being shipped. But when it comes to design, once you release your code, you don't get a chance to pull it back. So there is no detection component when it comes to risk with software development, okay? But severity and occurrence, and those of you who even thought of using RPN, um, just doesn't work. So let's talk about this column here. This column here, this class column, or what I like to call the residual risk column, the most important column in the software design team for determining what you got to work on. Okay, which, okay, first of all, let's look at, oh, I want to show you one other thing. Let's talk about this occurrence rating. When you do this occurrence rating, you see these high numbers, one in 10, one in 20, one in 50, and you're going to say, oh, I'm not going to test that many incidences. Well, the other way you can look at it is from a confidence level standpoint. You can say to yourself, hey, on this particular design, these are my confidence level breakpoints. So I have to at least test enough to get to the confidence level I want to be able to assess and then 
based on how many failures I have, I use that to determine my occurrence rating. You can either count up failures or you could use confidence level to determine this occurrence level, which this number and this number together are going to be used to determine that residual risk of that class. Let's see what that looks like. So what happens is, is you create what we call a miss, uh, risk matrix, and I don't know who the audience is. I put together two matrices. One is for the auto industry, and I also put together a matrix for the medical industry. This is the auto industry. They tend to use 1 to 10 severity, 1 to 10 occurrence. This top area up here is what they call the safety legal zone. That's because up in this area here, 9 or 10, somebody's going to be hurt. 10 means somebody's going to be hurt. There's going to be no warning. 9 means somebody could be hurt. There is warning. Okay. These down here, 8 through 4, these are returnable issues. These are why people bring things back. And finally, down here, 3, 2, 1. These are what I like to call conditioned response issues. These are issues with the product that most people don't even know it's there. They're not going to return it. However, you as a design engineer know they're there. So if a customer doesn't know where these issues are, there's obviously any of these levels doesn't get us real excited. However, the definition of one, and let's go back to look at the uh, currents, failure is eliminated. If there is a potential of me hurting somebody, when you get in your car, you don't expect to be hurt. So if there's any potential being hurting somebody, I'm going to be working on that software, that element of the code. This YS, these are loss of function related issues. Now, what's going to happen is I'll accept some of these. Whereas I can't accept any of these, so there's different thresholds. So bottom line is, is whenever you do a FEMA and you take the severity and the occurrence, if you're doing a software FEMA, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you're doing a, you know, we're going to talk about software FEMA, I'm not going to go through one, but if we were doing an application FEMA, if we were doing a requirement risk assessment, they all have this class column. Any line of these risk documents that has this symbol in it means you must take action. You must have some, make some attempt to fix it. So that's what this is. Now, on the medical side, here is a medical industry. Now, they tend to use, a lot of those companies tend to use a one to five with a one to three occurrence. And so what you see here is, is they have a depth. Uh, unlike a car where you get into the car and you don't expect to be harmed, depending on what I'm working on, like I've worked on stage four cancer treatments, the bottom line is we know that some of the side effects of what I'm working on could actually kill the patient. But we also know that if we don't do anything, that patient's going to die. So what happens is their rating system, their symbols are a little bit different. Okay. So what would happen is in the medical industry, anytime you see a letter here, these would be line items. Of, let's say their software controlled a medical device. Any line item that when they looked up the occurrence and severity ratings and it gave them one of these symbols, they would be expected to take action. So that's what we work on. But a more important question, or not more important, I guess equally important is, when do we release, okay? If we wait until the software is perfect, the product's perfect, all the risk is gone, you'll never release a product. So the bottom line is, is companies have what we call a risk policy. So we're going to work on everything that has a symbol. However, the ones you see in red, if we have any at these occurrence ratings, we're not going to release the design until we either have no symbols or get them all down to these YSs. On the next side, we look at the medical. Now, this is kind of neat because this gives you two different examples. The people who do 
stage, uh, late stage cancer treatments and spinal implants could use the same risk matrix. They're all going to work on the same things. However, when it comes to releasing the spinal implant or something related to the spinal implant, you're going to see that when I come in there for back surgery, I don't expect to die. I don't expect permanent injury, and I don't expect injury requires medical attention. I do expect to be sore discomfort so these are acceptable whereas over here when it comes to stage four cancer late stage cancer treatments the bottom line is these can be acceptable risks because over here i'm going to be saving patients lives so the bottom line is depending on the type of software you're developing you're going to need two things you're going to need a risk matrix identifying what combinations of severity and occurrence are acceptable and your company is also going to have to have a risk policy as you at what level of risk do you relieve the software do you release the software for use all right talk about agile software development so basically agile is there's a group of software development methodologies is Sorry for the typo here. I did a global replace, and I see I screwed up. This should say Scrum. Uh, based on iterative development, where requirements and solutions evolve, bottom line is you take these huge design requirements, break them into small sprint tasks. You allow the groups to work on those. You verify those. You make sure they're working, and then you move on to other sprint tasks. You basically can take this thing down, break it into smaller pieces, and it's a lot easier to eat that way. What's going to happen is if you use Agile, <clears throat> this big requirement here of controlling oil, this requirement's not going to change. You're going to get the same design requirement. However, you're going to take this big design requirement and you're going to break it into smaller sprint task requirements. And this method you do here is not going to be to prove that the code for the sprint task is written incorrectly it's to prove that you set the sprint task correctly so these like in something a requirement like this this sprint task itself could have tolerances on it and what you're going to do is you're going to have design controls in place to make sure that you properly specified these controls and these sprint tasks could also have hardware limitations on it as well because the sprint task people need to understand this is what I need you to do <coughs> and this is the hardware you're going to be expected to do it with and this is the variation in the hardware because these people need this information in order to write this code correctly so the bottom line is this cause column that used to be code when we do a straight design requirements to code now becomes a sprint task. And now rather than making sure sprint task code is correct, try to make sure our sprint task requirements are correct. And what's gonna happen is now we have the sprint task requirement. We fail to meet it. Now what's gonna happen is we're gonna inherit these effects. Too little applied. So when we fail to meet that sprint task, too little oil will be applied, the part surface will rust when exposed to the internal environment. So now we get into the actual code. So this design control over here is to make sure this code that we've written meets the sprint test requirement. Because if it's the right requirement, then we know when we go to run this test, we're gonna pass this test. The bottom line is, is when you decide to use Agile development, if you want to use design schemas, basically you're signing up to add another level. At the top level, you're going to have to make sure you have the right sprint task requirements and you have the right DV in place so that you know that those are the right requirements to design to. And secondly, you're going to have to have design verification in place to make sure the sprint task code is written correctly meet the sprint task requirements and again in all cases you know you're going to have this risk symbol residual risk 
when there is no hardware divide, uh, when there's no hardware involved, your life gets a little bit easier because the bottom line is, is I don't have to worry about hardware conditions or environmental. I have to worry about the temperature and how much variation in the hardware. So when I do my design verification, it becomes a lot easier to what we call control the degrees of freedom. So not having to do this makes life a lot simpler. So if we go all the way back here, this would just say do this function, I don't do this function, and these are the effects. Okay. So in summary, um, why do we do FEMAs for software development? Number one, uh, we get a clear definition of software design requirements. I would say, I could probably say 100% of the people I've worked with over the past 20 years, when they see the detail in the software design requirements that they get coming out of this process, they think they died and they went to software development heaven. Um, it enables you to identify and prevent causes of risk exposure rather than ending down, going down this path of trying to say, okay, if this fails, and I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you that you will not write code because there's gonna be fault handling code that when something fails, you're gonna have to take action. However, there's gonna be a big section of code that rather than concentrating on mitigating the effects when we fail to meet a customer requirement, we're gonna concentrate on just meeting the requirement because it's gonna be a lot easier. Uh, we're going to find that this clear definition of design requirements enables us to create great design verification plans. It literally will tell us how the product has to be tested. And then finally, uh, you're going to find out that if you were to take jumping all the way back to this slide here, this will add tremendous structure to your software development process. So I'd say, Dave, uh, that's the end of it, if anybody has any questions. Hello? Yep, sorry about that, Richard. I was on uh, mute. So um, seeing a question come up is about requirement analysis. You said that the objective of software for me is not to identify the way software failures, but to identify the way software doesn't meet requirements. What happens to this when requirements are missed? Okay, so like I said, this whole process, you get, let me go back to this slide here. If you get the requirements wrong, there's no risk tool that can help you. And the bottom line is, is we find that when we sit down with companies, that this is one of the things they do for us. And that's why we believe that, um, first of all, there's, different types of requirements you have to consider. We also believe that if companies are in a particular type of business, that you should develop some standard checklist of generic questions that you ask trying to come up with these requirements. And then at the end of that project, go back to those questions and ask yourself, did we miss anything? Can we make those, can we make that initial that initial questionnaire where we locked in on the customer requirements and we make it stronger. And if yes, then you make those changes. And what's going to happen is after you get two or three launches together, you're going to find out you do a much better job. But the bottom line is I'd love to tell you there's some tool that can help you if you miss a customer requirement. There isn't. Just got it. That's part of this customer requirements review and having a very structured process, making sure uh, we affectionately call it the um, first product I ever worked, I can't tell you who the company is, but the first company I ever worked with, uh, we actually developed a set of 17 questions and this was back in 1990, to be honest with you, and those 17 questions still work well today. We work on everything from cancer treatments to car parts, so. Next question. Okay, next question is, 
start jumping around here a little bit. Would you please confirm when you talk about software, we can also read across the embedded firmware? Yes, do both. Then another question, who in your opinion would facilitate, who in your eye should facilitate these system design, or these software design for me as a software developer or a for me expert? No, they, they, every, okay, first of all, the software designer has to own the FEMA. It's an audit of his or her work. Now, within a company, you can have a FEMA expert or a FEMA resource that helps people to get started until you can create internal expertise. So, I would say, Facilitating in the beginning, you're going to need an expert, but as far as ownership of the FEMA, it has to be owned by the software developer. And then you'd like those developers to be able to become skilled enough that they can facilitate their own FEMAs. You're going to find out that once you do these, once you, you're going to find when FEMAs are a, are a very logical process once you understand them. I think the problem is, is historically all the terms we get, we get hung up in what's a mode, what's a cause. Now, if I tell you, you know, the design, the failure cause of a software design FEMA is only, the only thing you can write there is code you might have incorrectly specified or calibration factors you might have set incorrectly. You can understand that. However, if I give you a book that's full of examples where that rule is violated and people get confused of what's a cause and what's a mode, then these things become more difficult. Our experience is, is that once people have been through a few of these and they got a good base that they can look at, they can take over facilitating their own. You don't need someone on your in your company called the FEMA. I think each company needs a FEMA guru or whatever that you can go to without questions, with questions. But I don't believe that you call that person up anytime anybody wants to do a FEMA. To me, it's not a position. Thanks, Richard. Another question. In the design FEMA for software, should the detection column rating be blank? And they noted that they'd seen somewhere where detection rankings change to level of control? My personal opinion is the detection, the only purpose of the detection column, again, we're limited with an hour, but the detection column rates the effectiveness of this method in determining whether or not this code is correct to prevent this failure mode. And so this grade, when we actually look at this, we look at this, we look at the actual test itself, and we say, do we have sufficient controls in place? Are we controlling, in this case here, if you look at this here, this tells you when you're going to do this design verification, you better be doing what? Controlling temperature. Because if I get high this swings, high this, and I'm going to get viscosity oil changes, this tells me that my performance between 20 and 90 could be considerably different, okay? Um, the other one is, is like this motor speed torque curve. How does this motor vary over temperature? And so what this rating is about is how good is this test method? So I would say this, if you want to use this rating to rate how good your design controls are, if, let me, let me go back a little bit. We developed the methodology when I started to work with HP, this was like 20 years ago. I would go in and I would explain to them, I'd pull the automotive manual up and I'd, I'd explain to them what is wrong with the rating system, okay? Why it doesn't work. And HP said to me, they said, you know, we're not automotive. We can do it however we want to do it. Well, how should we do it? So we developed a very objective way. Of, of assessing these controls. If I took that methodology today and I applied it to every automotive company currently doing FEMAs, design FEMAs, 
software design teams, if you want to be more specific, where one is an awesome, where uh, one is an awesome test, perfect, and is no test at all. Most automotive companies will rate out as sevens and eights. That's how poor the controls are. So you can use this column uh, to help pick out the weaknesses. And the test that I would work on would be those tests where you're experiencing failures in the field and you think you might be misjudging these causes. But uh, we leave it there because it's too hard to explain uh, why it isn't there during an audit. But I also believe if that column wasn't there, this RPN would go away and you'd have severity and occurrence and people would be concentrating on risk and that would be awesome. Having said that, the new manual is coming out with what they call the action priority. And my personal opinion is it is as screwed up as RPN. It just has different clothes on because it uses detection as well. So if anybody, if any of you are using the new manual and you go the new AIG VDA manual, look at action priority. You'll see that they they use detection to determine what you should work on. Well, I'm like, there is no detection in design. You don't get to pull the design back. Next Thanks, question. Rich. Yeah, I already uh, posted the link to the September webinar. I see we already got about a dozen people signed up for that. So if you're interested in not, not familiar with that term AP, uh, action priority, then you may want to click on that, get the link and register now so you don't have to look for it in September. Next question. My question is about system component, subcomponent analysis. Does the method apply to these or other levels of analysis? And how do you recommend analysis of interactions? Okay, so here's the deal. All right, so people, it all starts with their requirements, okay? So you have, um, it is so hard to do without being able to draw pictures. But anyway, if you start off with a piece of equipment, somebody, you as a software developer are responsible for writing code to control this piece of equipment no matter how many components it has okay if in your organization you have like multiple programming groups where let's say you know obviously if this was a this piece of equipment where we're applying oil maybe we were doing other functions on this piece of equipment as well as well and somebody else was responsible for writing code to do those other functions. You base the number of design schemas not on the number of components or systems, okay, that make it up. You base it on the number of design groups because each design group is responsible for meeting different sets of requirements. And you're going to find out that if you do design themas correctly, the interface requirements, all those issues will automatically be covered. You do not have to do system, subsystem, component themas. When on the hardware side, when people come to me and say, how many design themas do I need to do? My answer to them is, how many design groups do you have? If they say, I have two design groups, then I say, well, then you need two design schemas, one to assess the responsibility to make sure each design group did their job. So what will happen is at the very top, we have the requirement risk assessment, which is what the customer wants. See, the customer doesn't buy the system. The customer doesn't buy the subsystem. They don't buy the components. They buy what that collection of objects plus your software gives to them. But at the very top, you have the requirement risk assessment, and then you say, how many design groups do I have? So if I had, let's say I had two software design groups and three hardware design groups, I would say, when I do this particular project, I'm going to do one requirement risk assessment that sits on top to make sure that everybody's doing what they have to do to give to the customer. And then I'm going to have, for my two software design groups, they're going to do each a design schema. And for my three hardware design groups, they're going to do one as well. And we've done this on everything from uh, uh, 
extremely, I, I, I'm under confidentiality, but ex you think of an electric motorcycle. We did a complete electric motorcycle like this. It works. Great. I should point out, Rich, on your control panel, if you feel like you need to scribble stuff, there are some annotation tools there. One of them's a pen or something. You, you could also, yeah, at the very bottom of that last strip. And given that you're sharing your screen, if you wanted to use like Microsoft Paint or something, you could also bring that up and share it. So don't feel that you're limited. You can annotate if you need to. Any There's questions? another question here. Well, they wanted to get a copy of your 17 questions for requirements. I will have to talk to them. Have them give me a call. They have my contact. Yeah. Put your last slide up that has your contact information on. And I'll go to the next question, which is what is the sprint task? Okay, so uh, sprint task. So let's say um, you're writing a, and trying to keep it simple here. Um, let's say you're writing, well, here, let's just use our example. Better way. Okay. In order to do this particular function here, I guess is. They're going to have to know the viscosity of the oil. And to know the viscosity of the oil, they're going to have to know temperature. Before I can control the level of oil, I'm going to have to have some code that does that number one goes to the sensor, grabs the sensor temperature, and then does a vis calculation on the oil. That could be a sprint task that I would give to someone to help me accomplish this overall objective. So it's it's this huge requirement broken into a smaller piece. And that's a piece of code that we could write really quickly and we could test it pretty easily. Whereas this is a much more complex thing, we could take this particular item here and break it into a bunch of pieces. Those would be the, that's the simplest definition I can give you what a sprint task is. It's a small item you can tend to do very quickly and you can test. Great, thanks. That question has prompted me to run another poll here so that we can get an idea of whether or not people are acquainted with this terminology that we're using. This will give us a little feedback that will be helpful for the Rest of the we question. actually we had one client who uses Scrum. We actually developed a FEMA process for Scrum itself. We have a one-day class that we teach people how to apply FEMAs to Scrum, which is a method of agile process, agile software development. We've got about 180 people online, and I got like 51% that have responded. So let me share that poll with you. So uh, we've got 74% of that 50%. So uh, about 70 people are saying it's a good start. Need more working examples. All right, let me hide that and go back to the questions. Do you use a boundary diagram or a P diagram for software for me? No, not needed. I know that's going to scare a lot of people, but and when you when you take the requirements, we do a very structured decomposition of a product. We actually did a class for Ford Motor Company about 15, 20 years ago. And what's happened was is that people were putting, um, how do I say this? There's, there's information that you can get from a P diagram and a boundary diagram. We don't believe it's needed. We also find out that sometimes people put information from that boundary diagram, P diagram, the wrong place in the FEMA. They actually don't know how to use the information. Personally, we do not believe it's needed, and I know that's going to raise a lot of, uh, we haven't used it for 30 years. And I come from Ford, plant manager at Ford. So I was born and raised with it. And I just, I think there's more effective ways of developing design, uh, developing design FEMAs. Another question, typically hardware development leads software development, went along in the product 
uh, life cycle would you recommend to kick off the software design for me? Do we need to have a hardware design freeze prior to investing resources in software design for me to ensure more effective resource utilization? Okay, first thing you need to understand about design FEMA is to do a design FEMA, you have to have software. You don't do a software design FEMA to come up with a software design. So the design FEMA itself is a risk assessment. Now, having said that, if you're in an agile development, you'd start with your top level requirement, your top level design requirement, You'd identify the sprint task. Once you wrote that sprint task code, you could do a design schema on that particular section. Okay? So you don't use design schemas to come up with designs. You use design schemas to assess the risk of design. Your second question was? Oh, there was a part two to that. Yeah, I blinked it off the screen. I forgot what it was myself. Yeah. So we can put that question back in the second part of it. We'll go to the next question while they're doing that. In your experience, is it is it appropriate to have the uh, software developer do the FAMIA considering that it's it's their baby, the code? They have to be present. It's not a choice. Yeah, yeah. No, I think maybe they're expecting whether it's them leading it or just being participant. Oh, participate. I mean, you have to have knowledge of the, and again, you don't have to have an army in there. Like if you can, depending on what you're working on, especially if you're like in an agile development, I would not bring in all the different sprint teams if I was working on one particular sprint task. Okay. So the bottom line is, is whatever I'm working on, that's who I have to have there. But if I'm assessing the adequacy of code, to meet a set of requirements, then I need the people who wrote the code. If I'm trying to assess, you know, let's say I'm I'm doing a FEMA on whether or not the sprint tasks are correct. Who I need in the room is the people who understand the main requirement and the people who are writing the sprint task, because I'm assessing their work. I absolutely need the experts. Okay, so the second part of that question came back. If you do not use a boundary diagram or P diagram, then what else do you use? It is a CFD or LFD, and I'm guessing that's computational flow diagram, and I'm not sure what LFD is. Requirements flow diagram. If nothing is bottom, used, okay. how do you know? Okay. We have we have these 17 categories of requirements, okay? And once we do the 17 categories of requirements, in most cases, and again, these are very, it's a very structured, like we take like one, um, it's so hard to answer this in a short way. The bottom line is, is once we go through those 17 requirements, we understand, we capture the environment, we, we know what this product has to survive. And to be honest with you, it's not uncommon when we take, it typically takes us, in that first, uh, in one day, typically four to six hours, okay, we develop this set of requirements going through these 17 different categories. It is very common, like 95% of the time, that when we answer, ask these questions, that the client in the room says, I know we have a requirement in that area, but I don't know what it is. And so we put a TBD. Okay, and so when we get all done with this, you know, I'll give you, a, you know, I'm not giving away anything confidential. Okay, we did a we did a hybrid uh, system one time, and it um, we identified in a three day period, uh, 60 top level. You need to understand it was a very complex product, 14 different design groups. Uh, 12 different design groups, and in a three-day period, we identified 60 customer requirements. It was, it was a hybrid, not a complete hybrid vehicle, but a system in that vehicle. 60 design requirement and customer requirements, and they were translated to 600 design requirements spread across those 12 design groups, okay? And of those 60, I think it was 37 of them during the discussion, they said, 
you know what, we got that requirement, but I don't know what that number is. And of those 600 design requirements, once people saw what the actual customer requirement was, they go, my, okay, we have this requirement. And I'd say seven out of 10 of their requirements, they had TBDs in them. So what typically happens is, is when you use the method that we use to do this structured decomposition, you get this kind of smack in the head of what you don't know about the design. And now you know what questions to go ask. And it can be very shocking because we get called in a lot on product. We get called in on a lot on products that are struggling to save projects. And um, I remember one that I walked in on and in the first day, probably after 12 hours, I looked at the guy and he wasn't looking very good. And I said, are you okay? He says, are you mad at me? He says, no. He says, it's not like, he says, we've been designing this for a year. He says, and you, not you, they, by answering these questions, you said, you just blew the whole design out of the water. We didn't know any of this stuff. Now we got to go get all this stuff and I got to go talk to my boss, you know. So uh, there we have a very structured method. And uh, like I said, we believe it's much more effective than boundary diagrams. Thanks, Rich. <clears throat> we're at, after the hour, so we're going to have to finish up here shortly. Now, there is a question here. Uh, why don't you have the effects of the failure modes on local subsystem and system? I'd say probably you want to register for that September event because you'll get right. you'll get the coverage there. Uh, can hardware and software for me is be combined since there are two since there are interactions between the two? No. What the interaction between the two is the delivery of the customer requirement. With the requirement risk assessment level, that's where we, we say that, okay, the, the customer the customer doesn't buy hardware, the customer doesn't buy software, they buy this requirement. But at the very top level, we have that requirement. That customer requirement leads to design requirements for the hardware people and design requirements to the software people, okay? You go do that. Okay, and then when I bring you and so you go do your software requirements, you go do the hardware guy does their hardware requirements, they do their verification. For important terms you need to understand is the difference between verification and validation. Validation means you meet customer intent. Verification means you meet the design requirement. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna take that customer requirement, I'm gonna split it into software design requirements, hardware design requirements, the design hardware people are going to design theirs. The software is going to do theirs. They're going to do the design verification. When they pass their verification, proving that they can meet those requirements, I then prove the, bring the two of them together, and I do validation to prove I meet the customer intent. You do not want to mix software and hardware design seamless. Thanks, Rich. Go back to your last slide for contact information while we're going through these questions. We've got two more that we'll be able to go to. To build on the previous question, should a software design for MIA be used in tandem with structured code reviews, or does a design for MIA replace the need for code reviews? Uh, the, the code review is actually the DV. It's the design verification that will tell you whether or not you have a probability of failure. So that code review is at basically your design FEMA in the controls column will dictate the code reviews. That's a form of design verification. Good. Yeah, how to deal with the implicit requirements or non-functional requirements that aren't captured by these formalized requirements sessions? <laughs> you can't deal with something you don't know. All I can tell you is, is you can do a heck of a lot better job if you do it very systematically. And the last question, are there any specific suggestions for use of FAMIA on human machine interface? Oh yeah, we do it all the time. And that's where the that's where the application FEMA application FEMA is a big part of that. You know, in terms of you know what's the expectation of the user, what mistakes they can make. Like we um, we build uh, we have a client who makes car lines, and obviously there's a lot of human interfaces. And one of the most important FEMAs we do is we do an app after they design the equipment to do what it's supposed to do. We also do what we call a usage or an application FEMA that deals with the usability of the human interface. I wouldn't call I would I would call that an application FEMA. Very effective. Great. Do it on everything, medical devices and non-medical. 
So given these res results, Rich, we'll, we'll have to end here because we're, we're about 10 after. But given these results, you may want to consider coming back and doing something uh, maybe in a workshop format. Sure. So uh, explore your calendar and see if it's possible. We'd, we'd be uh, thrilled to have you come back and take a deeper okay. dive into this area. So on behalf of our audience and on behalf of the ASQ or Lab and Risk Division, I thank you for your contribution today. Very valuable. I think people were really interested and hope you come back in the near future. We'll see you at September 12th and maybe we could even add another one for a little deeper dive into these areas. Thanks again, Rich. We'll end it here. Thank you. Great day, everybody. See you later.